So Ben, welcome to Macros Plus. It's a pleasure to have you and thanks a lot for sharing your experience tonight. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so my talk is about the construction and use of C++ algorithms, uh, a lot about the construction actually. <clears throat> so uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Now, of course, you aren't all physically in the same room as me, but I'll try to answer, as Klaus said, any questions that you have, do please ask them. Um, I'll periodically pause and, and take questions. Um, we'll, get, we'll try and get them all answered. What I'm gonna cover is uh, all of these things. We're gonna look at, um, at a, a, an, algor an algorithm which is non-standard for a, a, a problem which is not that easy to solve with the standard algorithms, uh, but we'll look at a case study of, of that. And then we'll move into really some principles for algorithm design, some places where the standard uh, has uh, not mistakes necessarily, but holes. Um, so places where you can usefully supplement the algorithms in the standard, and then some pointers to further work. So why do we study the, al the algorithms? Because they really are the soul of the STL. You know, when, when I first started learning the STL, I learned containers and many people do when we think of the STL we think of vector but it's my contention that we should really think about find if if you want to really understand the STL studying the algorithms is the way to do it <clears throat> now one more preliminary about ranges uh, everyone says that uh, everyone says that algorithms are not composable this is not right um, STL algorithms are not lazy, which is what ranges bring to the table. That's a different saying, different thing from saying they're not composable to me. Ranges don't fundamentally change the way we write algorithms. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but STL algorithms are completely composable. In fact, in Sean Parent's words, they fit together like puzzle pieces. And the standard set of algorithms is mostly designed to support stable sort. And so the history of the algorithms is that, uh, well, back in 1998 or mid 90s, let's say, stable sort in situ was a fairly tough research problem. In the first edition of Knuth, it was listed as a research problem. Even today, it's listed as a, a term project for a graduate sort of thing. Um, so it's not a trivial algorithm at all, but all the algorithms in the STL pieced together in the ultimate goal of supporting stable sort in place. <clears throat> so further motivation for all those reasons we should we should write algorithms because the standard set is good but not always what we need not always good enough and because writing algorithms is fun um, now some of what i'll be talking about is at least partly subjective there are many algorithms out there and many choices and i've made some choices for this talk that reasonable people could could choose differently for their particular use cases um, and in a way, that's the point. There isn't just one formulation of an algorithm that does everything that solves a problem. You're free to make your own choices and still stay true to the spirit of what we're going to do. So let's, let's write an algorithm together. So at CPPCon 2019, the genesis of this talk, I might say, is um, uh, my local meetup group, the Denver user, meet, user meetup group is run by Scott Fredrickson and Jason Turner. They were looking for a speaker uh, shortly after CPPCon just, just passed, 2019. And I agreed to, to do the talk, but I didn't know what to do it on. And then as luck would have it, somebody wrote up on the board at CPPCon this problem. So given an array of unique 64-bit integers in a random order, create a practical algorithm which returns an integer which is not in the array in linear time. So undoubtedly, those of you listening are already thinking about some ways you might solve this problem. Uh, this is not a problem that's particularly a solution jumps to mind from the standard set. It's interesting enough for a talk. Uh, it's not completely trivial. Um, so that's why I picked up my talk. It was a, a great thing. <clears throat> so just to make sure we all understand the problem, here we have a container, let's say a vector, you know, without losing any generality, you might as well say a vector. Uh, 
and uh, we've got some integers in it and they're in some random order, some arbitrary order. And, and we want to find the un, uh, so a number in there which is unused, probably the smallest one which is unused. Uh, and this problem could come up in several circumstances. We could be giving out tickets, uh, you know, and apportioning things. We could be scheduling. Maybe there are some other use cases. And um, like I said, you've probably got some ideas listening to this talk about how to solve this. Uh, using a free list is a popular approach, for example. Uh, but we're going to look at a purely algorithmic way. It's not a very difficult problem to solve, but it's not trivial, as I said. So, so let's look at it. Let's solve it. Now, whenever I sit down to solve something cold, I think back to reading this book. My, my notes for this, for this slide just say, please read this book. It's from 1945. It's about solving problems, and it's really good. Some of the things this book says. Um, a useful way to attack a problem is to think about altering the constraints. If we can't immediately see how to solve a problem, let's try to solve a related problem. And once we do that, maybe we'll see how to add or remove constraints to reach back to the original problem. So let's start out with this problem by listing the constraints that we have. So let's restate them. Firstly, it said 64-bit integers. So that means that we have an ordering, uh, and we can, but we can't just do the naive thing of finding the largest and adding one because the whole space might be used or, or the, you know, the, the top end of the space at least might be used. <clears throat> we're told that they are all unique. Okay, fine. And we're told that they're in a random order. So this implies to me that we're free to permute the input because if it's arbitrary anyway, we might be able to permute it and that we can do this in place. Uh, we're told that we need a linear time and a practical algorithm. And those are really saying, practical to me says, yes, linear time and in place. And those, of course, are the two major constraints we always have in programming. We like to do things without using any extra memory, if possible, and we like to run in linear time or less. Anything above linear time tends to be specialized algorithms. We don't, we, you know, offline generation, things like that. We don't like to, at least in games programming, we, like to, we don't like to do anything uh, super linear too much. So lots and Almost all people that I saw suggesting a solution at CppCon suggested Radix sort to solve this problem. And, and it could, uh, but it would use extra memory. Some people suggested uh, bit twiddling, and that could also do something. To me, it's not very satisfying because it's limiting us to integers from the get go. Uh, and I'd like to end up with something, even if we don't start there, I'd like to end up with something generic. So let's relax some constraints. Let's change some. And then, like I said, maybe we can put them back after we get started on the solution. So we're going to use, I'm going to say just, let's use unsigned integers, make it easier to think about. Uh, let's assume they start at zero. That's kind of saying the same thing, I suppose. <clears throat> um, but that, in particular, let's saying, let's saying, let's assume the gap is somewhere in the integers. It might be zero, but it, it might not be. Um, there's only one missing number, let's say, and it's somewhere in the middle i.e. not at zero and not at max int. And this is kind of a big one to assume to start with, but let's, let's do it anyway and see where we go. Let's assume that they're sorted. So this highly constrained problem now looks like this. And now, now I, although I can't see you, hear you, now you're yelling at the screen to me, then this is adjacent find. The standard algorithm that solves this problem is adjacent find. Okay, so this works. Um, it's our first attempt and we have lots of constraints and, and um, let's see how adjacent find works. So it will go through from begin to end, yes, and we're giving it, uh, we're giving it the uh, predicate, which just says, if the difference between the two things is greater than one, then that's the gap. And at that point, we're gonna return uh, what the iterator is pointing to plus one, because you know that that plus one must put us in the gap. Um, and interestingly, this doesn't require exactly one missing number. Like that gap just needs to be greater than one, so there might be more. We'll find the minimum missing number. <clears throat> okay, so this is a solution. Like I said, we still have the major constraint that it's sorted, which maybe we'll look at uh, relaxing in a minute. So this, if the vector doesn't have a gap, 
we can't yet deal with that. We'd be dereferencing the end iterator if the get weren't found here. So let's try to deal with that. <clears throat> now the missing element doesn't have to be in the middle somewhere, it could be anywhere. Um, and now if we reach the end, we're just gonna return the, 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 the back element plus one, which is the value, which is the gap. I, there is no gap, but the gap is at the end as it were. <clears throat> and if the vector were empty, this doesn't work well either. We could add a check for that, but this adding a sort here would break our linear complexity as well. So this approach works for this highly constrained problem, but it's sort of running out of steam at this point. So maybe we need to try another approach. Um, before I do that, I'm gonna take a brief aside into a JSON find, which as luck would have it came up recently. Whenever I see tweets in the, in the run up to giving talks, I quite often see tweets, which because maybe because my mind is focused on the talk and everything that goes into preparing that, I see tweets which seem to, um, which seem to, talk, which seem to say something that is interesting for the talk and last week was no exception. Uh, so made of mistake, posted this tweet. And um, most of my Twitter, most of the people I follow on Twitter are either in the C++ world or in the functional programming world. And this was mostly in the functional programming world. So naturally I answered this with adjacent find. Um, several people tweeted answers, like I say, mostly in functional languages. Interestingly, I would have to say what C++ lacks in beauty it makes up for in robustness. Uh, many of the answers to it did, even in the functional languages, didn't support empty collections. Uh, and the great thing about standard algorithms is they kind of support empty, empty ranges out of the box. Uh, one more word on adjacent find. If you've seen Connor's talks, you would know this. Many, many algorithms in the library are named in ways that obscure their true nature. And adjacent find is this, it takes a single range, but a binary predicate because it's actually looping over two ranges, right? It, which is the range and the tail of the range. And like I said, if you've seen Connor's talks, you'll know how this fits into his taxonomy of linear algorithms. If you haven't seen Connor Hoekstra's talks, please rectify that at your earliest convenience. <clears throat> so zipping a range with itself is an important uh, and common algorithmic pattern. Uh, and what the only, there are, a few, there are a few standard algorithms that do this. Adjacent find and mismatch are basically the same algorithm. Adjacent difference is the same with, uh, with output. Uh, and the thing to be careful about is the iterator category. So uh, the difference between adjacent find and mismatch is that adjacent find takes a forward iterator and mismatch takes an input iterator. I, an input iterator, we can only traverse the sequence once. Because adjacent find is working on one range with its tail we need to be able to sort of look back at iterators we've already looked at. Anyway, so zipping a range with itself is a common algorithmic pattern, uh, either with a tail or with a, an offset. And when there's an offset, we don't have this yet in C++. This is sort of a class of algorithm we're still working on. Maybe there'll be some standardizations when ranges come in or maybe in 23. Um, and when we zip with Zipping with a tail is zipping with a one shift. And when we zip with an N shift, we get this sliding window. Uh, in range V3, there's, there's a version, but not yet in C20 ranges. Uh, and finally, something that annoys me is when people say that C++ doesn't have zip, but C++ has had zip since C98, and we call it transform. And it's more general than just zip because it's zip with. You know, zip is zip with make pair, if you like. Um, and it because we use transform, or at least in code bases I've worked in, uh, we've used transform a lot in, uh, in its unary form. Often it's easy to forget that it has a binary form that can zip two ranges together. And uh, talking of zipping, in C++20 we get starts with and ends with on methods as methods on string and string view. Uh, algorithmically, these are just wrappings of mismatch. And before we had these, this was the function that I had in almost every code base. Um, it, is, it is just, as you can see, doing a mismatch call and saying, did you get to the end of the prefix? In which case you were successful. 
Okay, so with all that said, end of aside, let's get back to the problem. We were using adjacent find, but that's gonna break the, I mean, that in itself is linear complexity, but we would need it to be sorted. Uh, so let me just pause there at the end of that aside and uh, ask what questions people have and, uh, and see if there are any questions to get forwarded to the chat. So we had one question. Um, okay. The question uh, relates to the uh, stadium minute. So why is max plus one not correct? If you're not at the borders of the range of 64-bit integers, this should be correct. Uh, if you're not at the borders, it is correct, yes. But we might, so <clears throat> the problem states 64-bit integers. I'd like to end up with a generic solution which might include, let's say, 8-bit integers. And so it'd be quite, it's easier to think that the whole 8-bit range, not necessarily that the whole 8-bit range is filled, but that um, the, the, for u and 8, the wrapping around section might be filled. So finding the max and adding one that might still be used in the collection. I hope that answers. Yeah, perfect, awesome. thank you. Great, okay, uh, back to the problem then. So we need a new approach. So what do you do when you have a problem to solve and, and you, know, you, you, you can't really, uh, or you need help thinking about it? Well, we're not in grade school anymore. We're allowed to build on the work of our friends, colleagues, and predecessors. And there are thousands of algorithms out there. All you need to do is know how to look for them. And this in the end is the reason to study algorithms, uh, to, know what, to know what the nomenclature is, to know the approach to use and the landscape of human knowledge, and frankly, what to Google for. So being good at algorithms doesn't mean being able to come up with optimal solutions out of thin air. Um, the thing to do is look in the literature and stand on the shoulders of giants. So <clears throat> the new approach is going to be divide and conquer. Now, this takes a little bit of uh, explanation, so I'll go a little slowly here. So here is our collection. We're going to assume that there is a gap. So what that means is um, the numbers 0 through k are with one with one missing number in there are distributed in the sequence with positions zero through k minus one. Okay, so we start out zero, one, two, the positions match the values. Um, I, I know this is sorted right now, but we'll we'll get to that in a sec and, and that'll be fine. Um, and so at, at the end, we have rather than value k minus one, we have value k because there is some missing value in there. Now let's imagine that um, M is the value halfway in that sequence and P is the halfway position. Now we know that if, if M is greater than P, we know that gap exists in the bottom half of this, of this collection. And so we can recurse on the bottom half. And conversely, if M is equal to P, assuming there's only one gap, that might be a constraint we can relax in a minute. But if M is equal to P, then we know that the gap is in the top half of the collection and we can divide and conquer recurse on the top half. So whichever half has the gap, we can know by testing that middle position and recurse on whichever half we need. And then when the size of our sequence is one, uh, the answer is going to be the, the value at that position plus one. Okay, hopefully everyone follows this, this idea. So we're going to divide and conquer. We're going to um, recurse on the top half or the bottom half according to whichever half has the gap, which we find by comparing the value at the midpoint with the midpoint position. <clears throat> so very, uh, very simply, very kind of, uh, you know, without, without getting any complex, anything complex in there yet, here's the first cut at that. Um, and we're using just unsigned pointers again. So we're taking our very first steps towards an algorithm. Um, so 
like we said, the base case, the base case is when the sequence has size one and the value is just going to be whatever's at that position plus one. And then the recursion, we're going to find the midpoint, um, find the midpoint M and then uh, find the value at that position. So dereference first plus M and then compare it to dereferencing what's at the first position plus M. So that's saying that the, the position should be equal to or comparing the value with the position. <clears throat> if they're equal, we're gonna recurse on the top half. So our first becomes that midpoint. And if they're, if they're less, if they're not equal, there must be a gap in the bottom half. So we're gonna recurse on the bottom half. Now at the moment, this requires that the sequence be sorted still. But now we can look at the algorithms. What can we do about that? Now we can look at the algorithms, the sorting algorithms, which don't require as much power as stable sort, sort, or partial sort or whatever. And what we want to do here is recurse on one of the halves. So the natural thing to pick is partitioning. We can partition the sequence around that value that should be in the middle. So, so this is what partition does. Um, we, we can say partition with a predicate of less than M and we'll end up with all of the good things partitioned at the front, all of the sheep at the front and all of the goats at the back, as it were. Um, and partition will return the partition point. So now, now this is what our algorithm looks like. Now we're not assuming a, a sorted sequence because we are doing that partitioning. <clears throat> now we have a version that works properly. Uh, it will return the smallest missing element. And you'll note that I've made the change also to put the value in there uh, as the parameter. As, as uh, we'll pass the value, we'll, we'll bind it to the argument. And uh, so when we're done, we can just return the value that, that we have. Uh, and then in the recursive step, it's exactly as you saw on the previous slide. This time we're computing the halfway point and then we're partitioning uh, around the value that should be at that point. And then we're saying if the partition point returned from partition was actually halfway, recurse on the top half because that's the equality case. Otherwise, there must be a gap in the bottom half. We return, we recurse on the bottom half. All right, so this, uh, I just wanna check at this point that people understand the approach um, and are there any questions about this right now? Not yet, no. Okay, good. Um, notice, a couple of things to notice about this. Notice uh, the way we're calculating half we are doing some careful handling, that, careful handling there to, to basically uh, handle even length or odd length sequences. So that plus one will give us rounding down in integer division. Um, we can now think about the time complexity of this. Partition is linear complexity. It will do n comparisons and uh, either n swaps or n over two swaps, depending on whether you have a n over two for a bidirectional iterator or n for a forward iterator. And we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, in, in the coming slides later on. Um, <clears throat> so we can now, we now have a solution that, that works. It's a sketch that works. We can compare it to the requirements. Now, assuming practical means linear time in place, we fulfilled these things. Um, it, there's no there's no extra memory and it's linear time because we're relying on partition. Uh, partition is order n and we're recursing on half each time. So that means that we're going to be order 2n, which is still linear time. Um, and at this point, if this were an interview question, we've got a good start. We've pretty much fulfilled the requirements in spirit. We're on the right track, it seems like. We still have a bunch of work to do, especially around types. <laughs> 64 bit inches, yes, waving your hands a bit at this point, and we'll, we'll dig into that some. Now about this in place, in place has a very technical meaning in algorithms, and it actually 
can mean something surprising if you, when you first sort of think how this must be the case, it may be a bit surprising. It means polylog or polylogarithmic extra space. So why is this? Um, well, if you have an array of size n, just having an index into that array requires log n bits of storage. So that, this is why in place means polylog extra space. Uh, not obvious when you first, uh, sort, of, sort of obvious in hindsight, but not obvious if you just sort of think, well, in place means in place. Um, what's the upshot of this? Well, you can be technically correct and argue with an interviewer about, <laughs> about how your algorithm works. I'll leave that up to you. You still might not get the job if this were an interview question. <laughs> All right, so we have a sketch. We have, we have a, an algorithm that works. This is a good time to add tests in order to make it properly robust. So what are some good test cases to add? Um, handling a zero length sequence is something all the standard algorithms do uh, out of the box. We want to handle even length and odd length sequences. We want probably want to test uh, where the sequence has a gap like at the end, are you starting at zero with no gap and the inverse the gap is at the beginning. We might want to test a sequence with a gap that's greater than one element. And we might want to do maybe some exhaustive tests for small use cases. These are all good tests to write at this stage. In the course of uh, preparing this talk, I did write all these tests and this was how I iterated on the algorithm. So the algorithm we have at the moment, once we have all these tests in place, then we can really start changing things up, improving things. Uh, we have, a recursive algorithm. So let's try to remove the recursion. Um, recursive solutions are usually the right place to start. They're very, uh, they're very good ways to think of algorithms. We probably want an iterative solution. <clears throat> and I mentioned that I added the value parameter. That actually makes this already tail recursive. So removing the recursion in this case is going to be uh, just that little bit easier because the, normally the first step would be to make it tail recursive. Oh, and we'll talk about that in a sec. So <clears throat> what we want to do is firstly, take that base case at the beginning when last is equal to first and change it into a while loop. So we'll say while, while, while last not equal to first. And then when that's done, we'll return, return the value. So we all we've done here is take, took the base case and Move the moved it into a loop, as it were. So we're going to have a base case that uh, when the base case is true, we'll terminate. And then once we've done that, we those return statements uh, need to become not returning the recursive call, but rather updating the variables which would be bound in the recursive call. So rather than making the recursive call to find missing element with p becoming first and m becoming value, in that case, we're just setting first equal to p and value to m. And then in the other case, we end up setting last to p. And so we just replace that with an assignment. So now we have, and we've returned, we've, we've returned the recursion into iteration. So what were the steps we took? Added an, an accumulator variable. In this case, I had already done that. Uh, we return it in the base case, and this, this fundamentally gives us tail recursion. If this were a language with tail, tail call optimization, which C++ doesn't have, but if we're working in a language which does have TCO, at this point we'd be done. Uh, but because we're in C++, we're not quite done. Uh, we, we convert the base case condition into a loop. It's typically while first, not equal to last in algorithms like this. Uh, and we're going to return the accumulator value after the loop. And finally, Instead of making the recursive calls, update the variables, assign them to their new values instead of effectively rebinding them in the, in the recursive call. <clears throat> so here we are. This is our current algorithm. It's starting to take shape. But now, now I hear you shouting at the screen, we need to make it more generic. It's not very generic. And one of the reasons to write algorithms is so that you can make them generic. So let's make it generic. Let's add templates. Exactly the same as the previous slide. All we've done is added templates. 
And I've deliberately been fuzzy here about what kind of iterator we're using. So it's just called it, it's just an iterator. We'll figure out what kind uh, and, and T. We know that T is gonna be the value type of the iterator in some sense. So the next question to ask is what sort of iterator do we need here? What is the iterator category? So iter iterator categories, uh, we have pre, pre C++ 20, we have five of them and C++ 20 added contiguous iterator, although that's only used in specifying ranges, I think at the moment, there aren't any algorithms that actually require it. Um, and they're partially specified now in terms of lower level concepts. So in C++ 20, we get sort of well-formed concept concept hierarchy for iterator categories. The major three iterator categories really are forward iterators, bidirectional iterators, and random access iterators. So with forward iterators, it's like a stood list, uh, sorry, a stood forward list uh, where you can increment uh, and you can look back at what you've looked at before, uh, but you can't go backwards. Bidirectional, you can go backwards. Uh, random access, you can jump around. It's like a, a vector iterator. It's an example of random access. <clears throat> so what you need to ask yourself to figure out uh, which iterator concept do you want in your algorithm? First thing is, am I using any standard algorithms and which concepts do they require? In our case, we're using partition and that requires a forward iterator. Um, so we, we know that we need a forward iterator at least. If that question isn't an obvious answer, we also need to ask questions. Do I look at an element after I've moved past it? Or do I equivalently, but slightly harder to spot is do I return an element after moving past it? Uh, both of those imply that I need at least a forward iterator in order to inspect the value of that position after advancing the iterator. Um, if I need to decrement it, which I do for some algorithms, then I need a bidirectional iterator. And if I need to randomly access it, if I need to increment the decrement by more than one, I might need a random access iterator. Now, all of these things, um, sorry, not all of these things, but incrementing by more than one is still doable on the forward and bidirectional iterators. It's just, it's not a constant time operation. It's going to take order n. And, uh, under the first bullet point here, the standard algorithms are going to inform our complexity guarantees. And they might be, it can well be the case that we can write an algorithm which uh, supports random access iterator, supports bidirectional iterator, supports forward iterator, but has different complexities according to which kind of iterator we give it. So the thing to remember, and the thing I, I really don't remember much is that all of these iterators exist in the hierarchy. Um, I, I don't exactly forget this, but I sort of, it's a blind spot in my head. I fail to appreciate it. I don't think about an, a random access iterator literally being an input iterator, but it is all these model is a, because it's basically a hierarchy. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. So uh, we said partition requires a forward iterator. Uh, it can work more efficiently with a bidirectional iterator. Uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, if you give it a forward iterator, it will take n swaps. Um, but if you give it a bidirectional iterator, it only requires n over two swaps because it can effectively work from both sides in towards the middle. Um, so from that point of view, we need a forward iterator here. Uh, we are also doing some iterator arithmetic which we will have to address because forward iterators don't exactly support uh, what we're doing last minus first, right? You can't do that on forward iterators. So we'll need to fix that up in a minute. <clears throat> but we'll need, we know we'll need at least a forward iterator. And so in C++20, this is what our function signature might look like. Uh, we, get, we get the ability to say the concept right there, stood forward iterator i. <clears throat> Prior to C++20, we don't have the concept, but we can at least call it forward it and do the appropriate thing for t in either case, either stood it a value t in 20 or with the iterator traits. So um, this will actually let us use not just 
the actual standard containers, but also uh, C arrays, for example. Uh, this is what forward iterator looks like in 20. Uh, and uh, you can see it, it builds on what I was talking about, that concept hierarchy. So we don't need to dive into all those concepts in this talk. Uh, but when you, have, when you have a forward iterator, you get to use increment, either post increment or pre increment, um, which are again from this concept hierarchy building up. And you get to dereference it, of course. Now, talking about, you know, we're doing last minus first and we're adding, we're doing primitive arithmetic because we started out building up with pointers. Uh, we need to convert that to using standard library iterator functions. Uh, and these are the functions. And <clears throat> so instead of doing last minus first, we need to call distance, for example, to find the distance between last and first. For a random access iterator, that's going to boil down to exactly the same code, you know, sort of one instruction, just a, just that subtraction. For a forward iterator, it's going to have to walk that iterator up to find a distance. So we're going to incur an order n operation. But we, that's the price of supporting forward iterators, I, I guess, if you like at this point. It doesn't impact the efficiency that we'll still get if, if the user is passing a random access iterator in. Um, but it allows us to support these iterators while still getting the efficient, effective pointer arithmetic with the more powerful iterators. So <clears throat> let's do some relaxation. Again, this is the function that we have up till now. This is what it looks like at the moment. Uh, and we need to clearly on that fourth line down where we're computing half, we need to relax that, which we can do with a call to stood distance. Uh, and we need to relax. We can't do first plus half when we're saying if P equal equal first plus half, <clears throat> that would require a random access iterator. So let's relax that as well and make a call to stood next. <clears throat> so in order to make this function friendly to forward iterators and the, the lesser the lesser, lessly powerful iterators than random access, uh, this is what we can do. <clears throat> so by relaxing these operations, we're making our algorithm more useful. What used to be only usable with C style arrays, vectors, things like that, now we can use with list, forward list, other things. And importantly, without affecting the runtime complexity for those other containers that have those stronger iterators. <clears throat> um, and if we're given the forward iterator, we know we're going to incur linear time with partition. So the fact that we're incurring linear time with stood forward probably isn't a big deal. You know, if the choice is uh, don't provide the operation or provide the operation with an expected complexity, probably you want to provide the operation with the expected complexity. Now, there are some cases where we might decide not to provide the algorithm for the weak, the algorithm for the weaker iterator containers, if there is some complexity pitfall there. If, because as we'll see, uh, complexity guarantees are part of the standard library it, uh, algorithm interfaces, and it's definitely a thing that should be documented. And if there is a performance pitfall there, you know, if it's if it's very surprising that you call it with a random access container and you get one complexity and then you call it with a bi-directional iterator container and the complexity falls off a cliff, we might decide to call that out and not provide that weaker version. But that should be really a, a human decision rather than a technical capability decision. So the fact that we can use these standard, uh, these relaxations algorithms in the standard to support the weaker iterators is a good thing. Okay, <clears throat> pause. Uh, any questions about anything up till now? So there have been a lot of questions, but people have already discussing them um, among themselves. So there's unfortunately nothing left that is left unanswered. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, thank That's you. Good. All right, glad, glad everyone's good with this. 
All right, so we've talked a bit about iterator categories. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, there's some holes in the standard. Um, not everything in the standard has the iterator category you might expect in particular. And there are some things we've fixed up with C++11. So here's, here's a case that was fixed up. In Alex Stepanov's original implementation of the STL when he, uh, for SGI, partition to, takes a forward iterator. In C++98, the way it was first standardized was with a bidirectional iterator. Um, and like I said, that is slightly more efficient. It does N over two swaps because it's able to work from both ends towards the middle rather than from one end all the way. Uh, but in 11, uh, we got this overload. Uh, we got it taking a forward iterator. And I expect most implementations at the time used something like tag dispatch. So you get, you get the ability to use it with a forward iterator without impacting the complexity of the bidirectional iterator. So that was something we fixed up. However, stable partition still requires a bidirectional iterator. And again, Alex Stepanov knows how to do it with a forward iterator. So if you require stable partition and you only have a forward iterator, good news is there's a solution out there. Bad news is it's not standard, but, but you can look it up. You can stand on the shelves of giants. Um, sort is sort of an interesting one. It's been, of course, requiring random access iterators for forever. But the C and we have sort as member functions on, I believe, forward list and list. Uh, the core guidelines say that's a dumb idea. I don't know whether that's a dumb idea because it, if, if you can do it by pointer swizzling, you know, that's fairly efficient. Um, there was a paper about weakening the iterator categories of some standard algorithms, which we took, took these uh, algorithms as, uh, as an example. Um, I'm on the fence on this. Like, I, don't, I don't know whether it would be a good idea or not to provide sort on bidirectional iterators. Um, but again, if you have a container that is, that is a non-standard one and you need to sort it and it's not random access, solutions exist. Uh, in-place merge is another one. So in-place merge is one of the three standard algorithms that uh, does better if we can give it a bit more extra memory. Uh, In-place merge, stable sort, and I think stable partition are the three. <clears throat> so if allocation is allowed, if the standard library is allowed to allocate basically at least the size of the smaller half here, either first to middle or middle to last, um, then we can do this algorithm with a better time complexity. Um, but again, it requires bidirectional iterators and it's doable with a forward iterator. A solution exists. I just point this out to say that, you know, if you look in the standard and you find you can't use an algorithm, don't think that's the, the end of the line. Look back, look in, look in literature, you're likely to find something. <clears throat> so what we did with the iterators there uh, was in the broad category of strength reduction. It was a specific form of strength reduction. Um, this is where we, we replace expensive operations with equivalent but less expensive operations. And it's done a lot by the compiler. It's one of the fundamentals of compiler optimization. But it's also important for us to do it uh, by human, as it were. Um, not so much to achieve the optimization in our case, because the compilers are really smart and they often see through a lot of optimizations we would try. Um, but more so to see the structure of the algorithm, the limits of the algorithm, what's required of the types in the algorithm. So when you write an algorithm like this, um, these are kind of the, the short list of operations that should be carefully considered. Um, if we're decrementing, uh, we might be able to just buffer the previous iterator that we looked at if we're just looking back one. So we might be able to uh, provide an algorithm that works on forward iterators rather than requiring bidirectional iterators, for example. Um, generalized addition, addition by more than one, is definitely a separate operation from incrementing. So that's to be considered as well. We should generally try to replace postfix increment with prefix increment. Um, it may be important for non-trivial iterators. 
for the compiler to uh, you know, not have to provide that copy. Um, we need to think about equality and ordering requirements on the types. Uh, we need to think about halving and doubling as an important operation that's different from just generic multiplication and division, because computers are able to halve things and double things really quickly um, compared to, for example, dividing things in a general sense. Um, and the sort of side story here is, you know, the, the most famous algorithm ever, Euclid's G GCD algorithm from about 300 BC in Euclid's elements, it's like the algorithm that all algorists love. Um, that algorithm stood unchanged for 2000 years until 1967 when a researcher uh, was constrained by the hardware that he had, Joseph Stein, was constrained and he had to find a formulation of GCC, no, sorry, GCD, um, that worked on his very constrained hardware. And he did it using, in among other things, a halving and doubling approach. And he developed the, the Stein GCD, which is more efficient than Euclid's algorithm in some cases. Um, it's, it's like a great story of how uh, adversity or constraints in your environment can, can you know, necessity is the mother of invention sort of thing. So yes, halving and doubling, very important operations to consider. And then, you know, if, this, if I were giving this talk 20 years ago, I would probably say, um, replace divisions and multiplications with shifts. But these days I wouldn't say that because if a plain, a plain division or a plain multiplication, compilers are well able to optimize those. I mean, trust but verify, sure. But I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go so far as replacing uh, you know, readable divisions or readable multiplications in my code with, with bit shifting equivalents. Um, I would trust the compiler to, to make that optimization for me. Um, now we need to think a little bit, and, and if you thought the talk up until now was about algorithms, the talk from now on is really about types. And, and really what algorithms imply about the types and the constraints on types. Um, so an important reference for this is of course, uh, the concept of regular types, uh, which is documented and now we have it in C++20, uh, originated by Alex Stepanov and it's in Elements of Programming. <clears throat> um, and regular means that types are default constructible, copyable, equality comparable. Um, so all of the operations that fall into these categories need to be scrutinized in our algorithms. Um, regular in C++, I should point out, doesn't mean quite the same thing as Stepanovian regular, because when Alex Stepanov originally uh, wrote down the idea of regular types, he included, uh, he included orderable, included total ordering, uh, and indeed assignment. Uh, but we don't have total ordering in our regular concept in C++20. But any, any place we're default constructing something, any place we're copying something, any place we're comparing for equality, um, it now behooves us to, to recognize those places and recognize that those are constraints on our types in our algorithms. And Eric Niebler put this very well in a tweet, his generic programming pro tip, Yes, concepts are constraints on types, but you don't get them by looking at types, you get them by studying algorithms. All right, <clears throat> here's what we have so far. After strength reduction, after the iterator strength reduction, uh, and it's coming along pretty well, there is a lurking issue here. And it, if you were all in the room with me, I'd ask you to put your hand up. You can put your hand up, I won't see it. Um, maybe you see a couple of issues. <clears throat> what, what happens here if we compile with dash W conversion? What we see is distance type, the thing returned from half, uh, thing returned from stood distance, which we're assigning to a T, that's a signed type. And if we're passing in unsigned things, 
we will get a conversion warning or a conversion error. So what's returned from distance is signed. Uh, well, the first thing I did was put in a static cast. Seems okay for now sort of thing. Um, I don't like it. Uh, it didn't really add any assumptions to the algorithm. So we'll go with that for now. Um, but now again, I hear some of you shouting at the monitor and especially to me, why isn't anything const here? I mean, <laughs> I gave this talk with Jason Turner in the room. <laughs> he was rather animated at this point. Okay, so let's take everything and make it const where we can. And indeed const expra. And most of the algorithms are const expra in C++20, which is great. <clears throat> so there's no reason why this shouldn't be. std partition is const expra. So this change is simply to add const expra in the front, const on all of the variables that we use where possible. And that's a pretty, pre pretty mechanical change at this point. Okay, this is starting to look better and better. We're still sort of tweaking things a little bit. One more thing we can do maybe to make the call sites a little easier is to uh, default construct that third argument, that value. <clears throat> so that not normally we've been thinking about unsigned integers and they would start at zero. So the default value of that would be zero. We default construct it, we get, we get an analog to some kind of zero with whatever type we use really. And we get literal zero in the case of integers, of course. <clears throat> um, so this might make the call site a little easier. If you can just say find missing element of the range and zero is understood as the, the starting point. Let's think about preconditions and postconditions, even if we can't express them in contracts yet because we didn't get contracts quite in C20. Uh, these are some things that I came up with and a couple of suggestions that um, people at the Denver meetup came up with. Uh, we need to document our assumptions. So first assumption is that the range actually has a gap in it. Um, doesn't, or I should say the gap might be at the ends, one or other end, but, but basically, if we're looking for a gap in a range of unsigned uh, uint 80s, we don't have all of the values pigeonholed, as it were. There is actually a gap to be found. <clears throat> uh, the sort of uh, an assumption which is actually really hard to express in contracts even is that last is reachable from first. In other words, if we keep incrementing first, eventually we get to last. Um, we might have the assumption that we don't have any duplicate values. Uh, someone, when I gave this talk at the Denver meetup did bring this up. Although having thought about it, I'm not sure this would break our algorithm, but it's worth considering. Um, we don't want UB on overflow. Uh, so we don't want that. And the post, uh, the post uh, condition is that we've permuted the elements. So we get to make some decisions here really about, first of all, we want to say, what are the assumptions? And then we want to decide, well, what happens if the caller uh, violates those assumptions? We can do a few things. We can, we can do nothing. We can just let them be UB. Um, many algorithms do that. And that's actually, you know, for some of the assumptions, that's a perfectly fine approach. For the reachable assumption, probably, that's a perfectly fine approach. Um, we might want to express what we can in contracts if and when we get those. We might want to assert on our assumptions. We might want to throw exceptions. Um, this is really a case of figuring out what the assumptions are and then making a reasoned, deliberate choice informed by the environment that the code has to work in and the needs that you have. Now, I've been blithely going through and I've just given it this name, find missing element. Um, and some of you might think that's quite wordy or not quite right. It's a bit verbose, it's not completely descriptive. We should spend some time thinking about what a good name for this algorithm is uh, because names make things easy to reason about. <clears throat> now, in particular, we do find the smallest missing element and uh, there needn't be just one missing element. Um, and we might think about some of the use cases to give this a more bounded name. 
Um, I'll pause here for questions and or suggestions, if you have any, <clears throat> and I'll take a sip of water. I'm not hearing any any questions or suggestions yet. <clears throat> well, people are still typing. Ah, right. So I'm not quite sure. So T is swappable, T is comparable, T is orderable, T is incrementable. Okay. Yeah, I, I think people are still thinking about the name. Okay. Well, some of the names that were suggested um, find first vacancy was suggested at my meetup. Um, Fu was suggested at my meetup, which I think we can dismiss. <clears throat> um, I have a couple of names that I have settled on. Um, if you have ideas, that's great. We, you can suggest them after the talk. Um, but since I already wrote the slides, what we're gonna go with is min unused. I also like min absent, but uh, min unused seems like a pithy name to me. So, and because I wrote the slides, that's what we'll go with for now. <clears throat> so yes, I mean, this is a discussion we can have that's sort of ongoing. So here's our algorithm, pretty much in the final version. We've talked a lot about how we've molded it, how we've made it generic without losing efficiency. Um, and we've talked a little about figuring out the type requirements. So now we think it's done. Now's the time where I loaded up my test with more types. Because so far we've been talking about integers, integral types, maybe they're unsigned, maybe they're not. But actually I want to do things like this too. I have some, maybe some scheduling slots and I want to use strongly typed time. So I want to use chrono durations in here. Um, so I'd like it to work for this use case. You know, I have some chrono seconds and I want a gap. I want a time slot where there's a, a gap there. When I do this, the compiler tells me this, no matching function for call to next. So if we look back, now when T is a chrono duration, what I'm trying to do is call next, giving it an iterator and a duration because I half is a duration now. So it wasn't quite right what I did before. And these are the things you find out by trying out different types. So half there is a T. We now know that's not the right type. And considering the ints only, made, thinking about everything as ints, including, including uh, you know, pointers and iterators as integer-like, that's the thing that really uh, blinded us to these other types here. So what we need is to stay true to the types. Half can be... The, the thing that distance returns, which is assigned integral type. What we're really discovering here is that our T should be constructible from that type. So if I go back one, you'll see that uh, the only change here I made is take out that static cast for half and instead construct a T when I'm constructing M there. And that might be a narrowing conversion. And I think that's okay. We're doing the right thing here by passing the right type of thing to next. And we're doing the minimum number of conversions we need. But what this has really told me is that there's a crucial requirement on these types. There is in some sense a correspondence between the values of T and the integers. They're, they're countable, they're ordered. We know that if we want to call it with zero, one, two, three, five in seconds, there's a correspondence between those seconds and the integers, one, two, three, five, and indeed four. So, <clears throat> so that's okay. Okay, so this is a little bit better. Now we can use it with chrono seconds, chrono durations. Well now, now I want to load up some more types as well as chrono durations, I want to use chrono time points. Um, they're slightly different again, they're constructible from durations, uh, but I might want to do this. Again, there's a correspondence between time points and integers here. Uh, does my algorithm work? Well, now I see constructing it from the half 
must have been not quite right either because there is no constructor from just an integral type, assigned integral type here, to a time point. Hmm. What did that mean? Well, what that means is, well, time point and duration are this pair of types that form an affine space. And it's a fairly common thing when you start looking for it, you see it everywhere. Sometimes, even though they might be represent representationally the same, they're both under the hood, just integers, but sometimes in your vector space, in your affine space, your point type is different from your distance type or your difference type. So time point and duration are an example of this. Also pointers and pointer diff t. <clears throat> and, and so what we get when we subtract two time points or two, two points in the affine space is the difference type in the affine space. When we subtract two time points, we get a duration. When we subtract two pointers, we get a putter diff t. Uh, we're not allowed to add two pointers. We can add a pointer and a putter diff t. We're not allowed to add two time points. We can only add a time point and a duration. Or we can add durations and we can add putter diff t's. But adding two points in they find space doesn't make sense. You have to use the difference type there. And this is fairly common. And this gives us an insight into now what we really were thinking, um, what we were really getting towards. So now we want to allow for that and represent our difference type, diff t, separately from our point type, which is t, the values. And we can do that. What we really want to do when we're constructing m is the value is the point type, and we need a difference type to add to it, not a, not a not a point type, not a time point, but a duration, not a pointer, but a put a diff t. <clears throat> and now this is pretty good. This is now starting to reach the point where I would be happy, and indeed I have um, used this in production code. I mean, it, algorithms are something I'm always thinking about, um, but you know, this is this is pretty good. <clears throat> I'll put an asterisk on that finally. <clears throat> so given the algorithm, uh, writing it is one job. Uh, we need to do some more things. We've thought about type requirements that we can document. We've done that. Uh, we need to specify, we need to, in order to document it, we need to document what it returns. Uh, we need to document the complexity guarantees. All of these things we've talked about already. How many applications of the comparison functional swaps or, and, and these can vary by iterator category. Like we said, partition, when you give it a forward iterator, it does n swaps. When you give it a bidirectional iterator, it does n over two. <clears throat> and complexity is a first class feature of all STL algorithms. It's part of their interface. It's documented. It's a first class feature of the STL. Uh, we should also document the way we chose to handle errors. I've left no except out of all the slides, partly because it's slide wear and it's just noise, but also because, you know, the error handling choice you make for your code base is, might be different. So it may well be that you could mark this no except and go on your merry way. And um, it could be that in your code base, uh, all copies and swaps are also no except. So when partition move things around, we can be sure that's no except. That might be appropriate, <clears throat> you know, or it might be appropriate just to leave no except off there and let things uh, have a exception throw on, on a copy, maybe. But it's something we should think about, it's something we should document. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll pause there before we, before I get on talking a little bit about ranges and uh, see if people came up with names or, or questions. So there's a first, of, uh, first couple of upvotes for first absent. So absent seems to have struck a nerve. This seems to be a favorite. 
But there's also somebody who says that the algorithm only works on sequence of numbers. So the name of the function should highlight the, uh, this in some way. So the proposed name is min unused number. Cool. Okay. These are, these are good names. Yes. I like, I think I like absent a little bit more than min unused. I, I only sort of thought it up a couple of days ago, or I thought that when I did the, I only came to rework the slides and I didn't want to like introduce errors in the slides. So that was really the reason I went uh, with min unused as it is in the slides, but I do like min absent, um, min unused or min absent number. Uh, yeah, I could see that. Um, All right, then there's a little discussion about the real complexity, but I think this already has been clarified that it really is indeed uh, ON, nothing else. Right. So the partition is O N and we and we always recurse on a half. We know it's a half because we pick the midpoint by by the halfway point. Um, and so we effectively get n plus n over two plus n over four plus n over eight, etc. And so that boils down to two n, which mm -hmm. is linear. Yes. I, yeah. I imagine that's how the questions and discussion went. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and there is now a question. Is there a constraint that this takes an input of sequence of integral numbers? That's a very interesting question. And it's one that I was considering a few days ago. Um, and it sort of gets into deep mathematics. So strictly no, but only, but well, Strictly, I think strictly no in C++. If we were able to model the reals properly, it's true that it would not work on that, on the, on the reals. So there is, they are at least countable numbers. There is some correspondence with the integers. Uh, but, you know, we could say that in C++, floats have a correspondence with the integers because after all, there are a finite number of bit patterns. I don't think that's particularly useful in this case, but it is a good thing to think about. Right. I hope that sort of, if, if it doesn't really answer the question, it at least gives my thoughts. It's quite a complex question. Um, okay, and there's a, a slightly off topic question, um, but still it may be interesting to, to surely discuss it. Would you recommend writing algorithms for iterators so algorithms or for ranges, or would you write both? Ah, okay. So perhaps the, sli the slides coming up, we'll, we'll talk to that a little bit. I, uh, I don't, you know, taking a 10,000 foot view, I don't think that ranges really alter a lot of the fundamentals of writing algorithms. They, they slightly generalize iterators. Um, Mm -hmm. but they don't alter the fundamentals for me. So I would view, for example, I presented this without writing it for ranges, uh, but I don't think it's a big deal to fit this into a code base, which is more range based. Right, so thanks a lot. All right, great, let's continue then. So so I, we were just talking about ranges. Um, like I said, Ranges don't fundamentally alter algorithm construction. They don't, in 20 at least, give us too many extra algorithms yet. Um, I don't know if they give us quite any extra algorithms. I don't think they do yet. Range v3 gives a few. Uh, but what they do give us is laziness. And what I've taken to thinking of as algorithms in the iterators. So what do I mean by that? What ranges do for me is that they take a lot of the things that I would traditionally think of as algorithms, transform, reverse, copy, remove if, a lot of the, especially the almost all uh, linear algorithms in this case, so not things like sort and, and, and uh, partition, uh, but uh, the, the algorithms which go through things linearly, almost all of them become views in rangeland. Um, and from that sense, they, it's like they are smart iterators. And if you've seen, you know, you've probably seen talks on ranges. If you've seen uh, Jonathan Bakara's talk on smart output iterators, that is another one which is in this vein. 
So um, by giving us, you know, that pipe syntax and the views, uh, the way I think about that is composing those algorithms into the iterators <clears throat> so that they can be lazy uh, and so that uh, they can be ubiquitous. They give us those things, they give us, so they give us some of the things we think of as algorithms, as views, and therefore as sort of in the iterators. And they also give us um, composability of iterators in a, in a more unified way. Um, and, and what this does is fill in all of the sort of variation holes in the standard algorithms. So the counted variations, we have things like copy and copy n, uh, but we don't, we have accumulate, but not accumulate n, right? But when you get ranges, because all of these iterator runes come in the views and in the range iterators, that's what we get with ranges. So if you want to have a reverse strided counting move iterator with ranges, you can. Um, prior to ranges, you might have to write an algorithm variant to do that, an algorithm variation. And there's nothing wrong with writing algorithm variations um, because what, what that gives you is good names, right? We have copy and copy n. We have move as an algorithm, not uh, the cast of any reference move, but the move algorithm, uh, we don't have move n. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with writing these variations. When we get ranges, if you're working in a range-based code base, you'll get all these variations composably, sort of ubiquitously. So that's the good thing about ranges. Um, let's talk more about a bit, a bit of complexity. And again, mistakes is maybe not the right word, but missed opportunities in the standard. So in 98, we have that the complexity of sort is n log n on average. In 11, we tighten that up to say just n log n. Now, the same work that uh, allowed us to make that tightening would allow us, basically the same basic work would allow us to make the same tightening on nth element. Um, because the work by Dave Musser in particular, and Dave Musser is a great name to know if you want to, you know, we all know uh, Alex Stepanov and Sean Parent and those names uh, in the field of C++ algorithms. Uh, Dave Musser did a lot of work around the turn of the millennium in particular. And um, some of the stuff he did laid the groundwork for things like this. Uh, his papers are a great source of things to go and look back at. Uh, so, so we haven't yet tightened up the complexity on nth element. It's linear on average. Uh, I think based on the work of intro select, which is closely related to intro sort, it could be made just linear. Um, again, looking back at past papers, is a, a great source of algorithms. In 17, we get the standard searches, string searches, Boyer-Moore and Boyer-Moore horsepool. And these were implemented in Boost and we have implementation experience. And that's one of the reasons they came into 17. Um, but again, looking for sort of forgotten algorithms in the past, I came across this paper by Dave, David Musser and Gore Nishanov, two, two names which are known in the C++ community. And this paper is about a generic sequence matching algorithm that has a linear worst time bound and these nice properties, a sublinear average case that is better than Boyer Moore. But as far as I know, no one has looked into this, no one has taken this forward for standardization. Uh, I don't know of, for example, a boost implementation of this. So there are sort of forgotten papers, I could say, out there in the world that you could benefit from just by standing on the shoulders of giants. Okay, a uh, few more tweaks to our algorithm. We might want to provide different versions. One of the very common things to do in the standard is, you know, we are using uh, equality. Uh, we could provide a version that takes a predicate. We could provide a parallel version. Uh, that's left as an exercise. <laughs> that's a, probably a fairly hard exercise. <clears throat> um, but there are a few, a few overloads, a few tweaks we could make. We might be, we might want to do an iterator pair version and an iterator length version. Again, this is one of the things that ranges will bring to the table, which we'll get sort of for free with ranges. But if we don't have a code base that works with ranges, or if there's a reason we wouldn't want to use ranges, 
we might want to provide a few variations of our algorithm. Um, besides just getting this for free as well, it's sometimes useful to do this because you find out more about the algorithm. Some algorithms are more efficient when expressed with iterator and length than they are with iterator pair. So it might be that there's a slight difference in expressing it one way or another. You might be able to implement one in terms of the other. And um, you know, trying to implement both can be a useful exercise. <clears throat> um, by the way, we'll come back to copy n in a few slides, but for those of you watching carefully, copy n has a problem with its return type here. <clears throat> okay, so there may be some others. Thinking, so we said we've got a final algorithm. Again, it occurred to me fairly recently that we could have used nth element um, instead of using partition with this algorithm, because partition just separates the sheep from the goats. Nth element would also pin that middle element and give us everything to either side of it um, appropriately because we know the point we're pinning at, you know, partition returns a partition point. So we're saying partition around the median value sort of thing. But then the element we're saying, uh, we, know the, we, we know the point, right? And whatever value that ends up being. So there are two sort of ways to express this. I tried writing a version with nth element. Um, it works. It looks pretty much exactly the same as the version with partition, except just that slightly dip, just obviously the call to nth element, slightly different handling of things. It runs about 30% slower on average than the version with partition. So useful exercise, but that's what I found out. Um, it does sort of, you know, if we look at this, here we see one of the differences in, on that, when we're assigning in it, star mid plus diff t of one, that's sort of saying, you know, what we were saying before, there is a correspondence between these inputs and the integers. We need to construct a difference with, with one, right? And so that's maybe elucidating that there a little bit more. So it's worth doing just to, just to find that out. Okay, now we are done with our algorithm. That's the end of the case study. I pretty much um, done that to death, at least as far as this talk goes. Uh, we're gonna move on to something else. So just pausing before that. Okay, and we are a little short on time, but we don't have far to go. But I just wanted to cover a few things about um, algorithmic principles, if you like. So let's talk about arguments and argument ordering because we didn't talk about that yet. So what order should we use for arguments? And in, in one way, this actually influences function names. <clears throat> so you have a couple of options and the obvious option and the one that we sort of followed implicitly was do as the standard does. So there's generally a convention in the standard that if you have a parallel algorithm, your execution policy will come first. Then we take the iterator pair uh, or the iterator length that we're working on. But then we take some other input iterators if we're taking more than one range. Uh, then we would take any output iterators. Then we would take an initialization value. Um, and towards the end, then we take uh, an overridable predicate or comparison function. And finally, if we're in the world of ranges in particular, sometimes we take a projection or a transformation function that's, that's folded into the algorithm. Um, this is sort of the standard order. It varies a little, especially around like transform reduce takes, takes, the, takes the reduction operation before the transform operation, which is a, a little bit strange, but basically you can stick to this ordering. Um, there is another thing to think about though, which is that we have bind front. So um, you should order the arguments according to the partial application you wish to see in the world as, as Ayman Adim put it on Twitter. Um, or generally, because people can bind, in particular, easily bind the first argument with bind front, um, you might want to bind that first argument and then be able to vary other arguments. Effectively, now you have a function which, which is partially applied. You may, you may want to do this. And so arguments might be ordered according to the frequency or how you expect to bind them. And of course, option three is sometimes Hobson's choice. Sometimes we don't get 
a real choice because we have to do things because the language requires it. Um, if we want default values, we have to put them last. Um, might be an argument for using an overload instead of a default argument. If we have bariadic arg packs, they have to come last mostly. Um, and we don't, we don't have any variadic algorithms yet, but we can imagine writing a variadic transform uh, where, the, where the operation is an enary operation rather than a unary or binary operation. <clears throat> um, and in that case, we'd have to put the variadic pack of the, the other ranges first starts uh, last. <clears throat> so argument order can inform naming, in particular, if you have a binary function. Um, so once you've decided the argument order, according to your principles of, of whatever, um, especially for a binary function, what I like to do is name it as if it were infix, or equivalently in C++, as if it were, you know, object dot method argument. So if the arguments are this way around, if I'm, if I'm saying is prefix, if I'm doing a prefix check with prefix and string, if string comes first, I want to call the function the function starts with. But if prefix comes first, because I might want to have a different use case and bind a particular prefix and test it over lots of strings, uh, then I'd want to call the function is prefix of, because I'd want to name it because as if it were infix. This is just something that I like to do. <clears throat> so now as we come to the epilogue, epilogue of the talk, um, some of the things that have been implicit in this talk, and these are um, called out explicitly in um, Alex Stepanov's book, uh, From Mathematics to Generic Programming. There are four algorithmic principles which it behooves us to think about. The first one is the law of useful return. Uh, if you write an algorithm and if you compute something that's useful, you should return it to the caller. Um, not the same as just computing something because you think it might be useful, but if in the course of doing your work, you compute some intermediate result that is useful or that's not obvious to the caller, or the caller would have to do more work to recover, you should return it. The very obvious example of this is copy. It returns the output iterator. If it did not return the output iterator, the caller would have no means to recover the output iterator the copy had got to. Um, for each, again, is uh, we think of it as just mostly doing it for a side effect, but it actually returns the function that you give it. So if you have a stateful callable that you pass it, it will pass, it will pass you back um, that <clears throat> useful return. Rotate, rotate is one of the ones we fixed. Um, in C++ 98, it did not return anything, but now since 11, it returns the uh, the iterator pointing to where first goes, um, which is really useful, which, which you know, makes it really useful as a building block for other algorithms in particular. I mentioned earlier, copy n has a problem. And underscore n algorithms in general require a bit more uh, scrutiny because of this. Um, we're returning the output iterator, but we're not returning the input iterator we counted up to. So this loses information. If you call copy n with an input, with a true input iterator, um, the caller can't recover the input iterator that copy n copied up to. Um, and if it's a forward or bidirectional, the caller is still going to incur an order, order n operation to, re to recover that length that was copied, or that iterator in that position up to which was copied. Ranges fixes this. Uh, I don't know if this is exactly the very latest thing in the standard, but basically ranges does fix that to return a result which includes both iterators. Um, and like I said earlier, we don't have move n. We'll get that with ranges because of the composability of iterators and algorithms in the iterators. Um, but it might be useful to write that function or propose that function. Um, yeah, move end would actually be easier and more general than copy n, because if you have move n, i.e. something that uses uh, that moves between the iterators, um, all you need to do is pass it a const iterator, and then you've got copy n. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, Transform N is another one that's in my toolkit. And uh, this is what it might look like. <clears throat> Again, this uses a, this is a variadic form of transform N. So we use the comma operator, we use the fold expression over comma, um, and we use the static cast avoid to protect against overloaded commas, which is a common thing you find in the STL algorithms. Uh, so this is just what it might look like in, if, we, if we need it in our code base. <clears throat> oh, and it returns all of the input iterators that were passed at the end there, as well as the output iterator. So that's the law of useful return. It doesn't mean do extra work uh, to, to return potentially useful stuff. And it doesn't mean return things that a caller should really already know with no problem. But it does mean pay attention to intermediate stuff, free stuff you're computing, and would it be useful to the caller with the caller? find it easy to recover. <clears throat> the second principle is the principle of separating types. And we did some of this when we looked at, um, in particular, when we introduced the chrono types, the duration, the time point. And it can actually be useful to literally print out the code on paper and highlight all of the interactions between variables and see if you have disjoint subsets there. See where you require this variable to be added to another variable. Um, see where you require default constructability. See where you require the existence of a sentinel value. Um, all of these concerns are part of the law of separating types. There's a fantastic example of this from Sean Parent's C++ seasoning talk. Um, he gave, in addition to the version he gave at going native in 2013, he gave a more extended version um, that's part of the A9 lecture series on YouTube. Lectures, lecture five, parts one and two. Uh, and in that talk, he implements stable partition. And in the course of implementing stable partition, what he discovers by looking at the structure of it and how the types, how the variables interact, uh, he discovered that it moves, it moves things after it tests the predicate. And so that means that the information that the predicate tests could be stored in a separate data structure. Um, and he can, and from that insight, he gets the fact that he can store selection, uh, selection booleans, let's say, in a separate data structure from what, from the values that are selected and the variant of partition or stable partition that can use looking in that other data structure. Um, and so gets that separation of types. So the, the basic thing is don't assume two types are the same when they may be different. Try varying them in your algorithm, see what the compiler says, see if there's an affine space going on with types. We did some of that earlier. The third, the third uh, principle is the principle of completeness, uh, which really just says consider providing everything related. So that's what we talked about when talking about Maybe we want an iterator count version as well as an iterator pair version. Maybe we want to override a predicate, override a comparison function. Maybe if we're doing this for strings, we want to provide versions that work on string and string view and const char star and uh, see arrays of chars, things like that. And maybe single chars, which we want to treat as just string of one element. <clears throat> um, all these things are good ideas. Strings are particularly tricky in C++ because well, they're tricky, um, as you know. When if you have a, they like to, arrays like to decay. So if you have a const char star, then you might incur a strlen, uh, for example, which you wouldn't do in the case of string or string view. Um, on the converse side, if you overload a template to take an array of char, uh, you need to think that that is going to be instantiated for every different length string that you pass it separately, so that might be a compile time hit. So strings are kind of tricky and require some thought there, but these are some of the things that um, we might want to consider when providing a, com a complete interface. And of course, there are, <laughs> there are lots of examples in the standard of completeness violations. Uh, this is a tweet from Bryce from a while ago. <laughs> Many algorithms to my mind could do with, in particular, the iterator and length thing. Um, Here's another example of a completeness violation. Jonathan Baccaro has talked about this. Set symmetric difference is a great algorithm. Um, my normal use case for it 
uh, when I used to do, you know, network game programming would be on an update. I, I have an idea of a set of things and an update gives me a new set of things. Well, I want to know which of those things disappeared and which were added. So I want set symmetric difference, but I want it with two different outputs. One, one telling me the things that got added and one telling me the things that got removed. I want to know the before and the after, and maybe even a third to tell me what didn't change. Um, the standard set symmetric difference can't do this, but it's not too difficult to modify it slightly and get what we need. Um, I'm glad that in 20, lots of things are context for lots of algorithms, including lots of the numeric algorithms. Um, Connor has noted before that um, this completeness violation in transform inclusive scan and transform exclusive scan, they can't zip two ranges for some reason, uh, despite the fact that their, their sibling algorithms can. Um, so there are lots of completeness violations in the standard, and this just means we shouldn't be afraid to add our own functions that, that piggyback on the standard and provide what we need in our code bases. The fourth principle is the trickiest one of all. It's the law of interface refinement. And this is basically the law that says, you can write an algorithm and it can work and it's great. And then five years later, you discover there's a massive, massive problem with it. <laughs> because it's really hard to know what the right formulation of interfaces is until you have experience using them. Um, the very famous example of this in the standard is Max. So when Stepanov was making algorithms, he made min and max, he had to decide what to do when A and B are equal. And he said, well, we'll just return the first one. And min does that, and Max also does that, unfortunately. And it's not entirely clear at first blush why that's a problem, it only becomes apparent when you start using min and max to build things like lower bound and upper bound and consider stability. And, and then it becomes clear, you know, five, 10 years after the fact that when they're equal, what you really wanted was max should return the second one. But we're stuck with that. Having said that, min, this is the version of min you might see a lot in talks that are out in the world today from big conferences. And this is not min, this is wrong. Um, this, uh, so read this carefully. This says, if A is less than B, return A, else return B. What that means is that if they're equal, B will be returned. This is not, this is not min. Um, min should be, if B is less than A, return B, else A. Um, in 2016, I counted four talks that had this up on the slide and in as recently as 2020, and I still encounter, I'm not going to name any names because these people are just, they know, they know the reality and it's just something you can easily put on the slide and I could have made the same mistakes myself. Um, it's also very common to describe remove as moving all the bad stuff to the end so that you can erase it. Again, that's not what remove does. That's what partition does. Remove just overwrites all the bad stuff by moving the good stuff to the beginning. But it's very common you hear, <coughs> you hear these things described this way. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. We mentioned before rotate, got an update in C++11. That was part of interface refinement. Um, and it's not, it, in this case, it wasn't just law of useful return. It was, it was also interface refinement kind of in that category. Um, and it's, much more useful as a building block algorithm as a result of returning the forward iterator. So these are the principles, useful return, separation of types, completeness, and interface refinement. Um, and uh, having, having basically solved the problem, you should think about these things in iterating on and tweaking and refining your algorithm. So as we come to the end of the talk, and thank you for staying with me, I know it's been a long talk, um, we started out with necessity. We started out with the fact that a standard set of algorithms isn't complete and, and with the advice implicitly of no raw loops, which is to say we shouldn't, when we think about solving a problem, we shouldn't just think about solving it in one case. We should, in order to understand its true nature, we should think about solving it generically and not just for one loop. 
So by building and examining the algorithms, we do get that insight into the true nature of the problems. And we get to generalize or specialize and we get to build that algorithmic intuition. That, that to me is, you know, Connor has some talks called algorithm intuition. That is precisely seeing a problem and seeing how it's like another problem and therefore seeing how it can be attacked by algorithms that we already know. Um, it also allows us to identify how the data interacts and efficiencies that might result at the API level or the machine level. And in the end, almost all of programming is applying algorithms. I saw a tweet the other day that said, um, a program is where you apply an algorithm, uh, or you change a data structure with an algorithm until you get a data structure you can print out. And that's, that's really basically it. Um, so as I said, we can expect ranges to expand all of the algorithmic variations that we can easily use. Um, but until you can use ranges, or indeed when you can, there's no reason not to write those variations yourself. Um, ranges also give us all sorts of things like all the iterator composition we mentioned and the, much, and the firmer footing of the concepts that we can now express. But they don't fundamentally change the actual task of building an algorithm examining the types, discovering the concepts, that all remains the same. So I have a few recommendations I can make. There's some stuff which is free online. Elements of programming is now free online. If I had one recommendation to make, I know that uh, lockdown doesn't magically give us all gobs of free time, but if you do have any time, all of these A9 lectures are absolutely worth your time. There is over a hundred hours of content here and it's just all fantastic. Um, in the realm of not free, there's a bunch of algorithm books you can, you can read. Uh, it seems like a daunting task, but it really is a task that accumulates. After you've been, one day you wake up, you know, a few years down the line and you realize, wow, I've actually read a lot about algorithms and I have a good idea of what the landscape is. And the point of learning is not, as I said, to be able to write this stuff cold, you know, it's not to pass an interview but it's to know that it exists, is to be able to recognize the problem, know the landscape of human algorithmic knowledge and to build your algorithmic intuition. So if you want to, these are all free from your local library. Uh, if you want to get started with only one thing, pick something from this list. And these are all uh, fantastic, fantastic resources. So with that, I'd like to wish you happy coding and uh, Wish you the best on your journey if you wish to study the algorithms and have fun with them and maybe even write some papers because there are hundreds of algorithms that aren't yet in the standard. Thank you very much. And I will take questions or in a chat afterwards or however. So thank you very much, Ben. That has been a great talk. There is a couple of more um, questions. Mm -hmm. So there was a technical question uh, about the transform n example that you showed. So why do we need standard oh. invoke in the transform n example instead of calling the callable directly? Ah, why do you need standard invoke? Yes, I will try to go back to that. Well, you can call the callable directly. This is this, this is it. Okay. Um, it might be enough for your use case to call a callable directly. Standard invoke is the very generic way to invoke any callable. And one of the particular callable types that often gets overlooked is pointer to member data. Um, so when we write these functions, we often think about, you know, pass it a function pointer, pass it a lambda these days, probably is first choice. Um, what we overlook often, what I overlook often, is the fact that a pointer to member data is a is handleable by invoke. You can invoke that. It's effectively a function that takes an object and gives you back the data member for that object. So it's a projection function. Ranges give us some of that. Um, and they're very useful for, uh, for providing interfaces which are similar. Um, uh, Sean Parent has a section in, in his seasoning talk about it. Um, but yeah, the reason that you stood invoke here is to be, you know, it's, it's slideware, um, it's maximally generic, it handles pointers to member data as well. So you can't, if, if you were just to call the callable there, pointers to member data wouldn't work. Okay. 
then uh, you don't see the, the the chat that says a lot of thank you. Uh, thanks, Ben. Great talk. Uh, I definitely need to spend more time reviewing algorithms. Uh, very good talk, etc. So some people are um, requesting the, the recommended slide. The last oh. thing uh, that you showed, this is definitely something that indeed may help uh, some people. Um, okay. Uh, I can also, so there's that. Um, if I could make one recommendation, I would say watch the A9 video series. Okay. Um, not only are they fantastically interesting to do with algorithms, but Alex Stepanov is a fantastic sort of historian. Um, and the way he explains, you know, the history behind how these things came to be is, is really engaging. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, um, I don't see any more question from the audience, but I would have a question. Okay. So from my personal experience, um, so in my C++ trainings, I also often talk about algorithms because surprisingly, a lot of people are not even aware that they exist. Right. But then if you show a couple of examples, then very, very often, I would argue at least in every second training, somebody remarks, but this is simpler to read uh, in a for loop. This is easier to do with a for loop. Mm -hmm. So what would you, an admirer of algorithms, tell them? Uh, a few things. The, the first thing I would say is that readability is familiarity. Um, what you find readable today will change in two weeks if you just expose yourself to new things. And so if, if your claim, if, you know, not you Klaus, but if, if the, if the yeah. questioner's claim is, I find a for loop more readable than a call to std transform, for example, mm -hmm. I would say, after you've been using std transform for a couple of weeks, you'll find that just as readable. That's the first thing I would say. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I would say would be for loops have a habit of starting out very well intentioned, but ending up rather messy and more difficult to read. They have a habit of accumulating cruft um, and, and they don't have good names. You know, you might, you might have a, a comment saying, you know, the fa Tony's famous like stage one, stage two, stage three above your four loops in the function. It's, it's uh, nice to give things names. It's nice to make them functions and where those functions exist in the standard, why not use them? Uh, so from the point of view of clo code cleanliness uh, and, you know, code readability from that sense, I would also point that out. Okay, thank you, very good answer. I mean, I, 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 doubt, I doubt very much that this, this answer is telling you anything new, Klaus, uh, but uh, it's worth saying anyway. <laughs> All right, so um, just a couple of comments about your answer right now. So plus 100 on familiarity. Um, okay, I think this is it from a question point of view. Okay. Thank you very much, Ben. It has been a real pleasure having you on. And uh, so I mentioned again, for everybody who's not reading the chat, there is an after talk um, chat. Ben will be there too. So you can ask him personal questions. Um, the link is in the, um, in the Twitch chat. Okay, thank you again, Ben. See you, you in a couple of seconds. Go, bye. Bye.